Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm happy today to be talking to Mike Rothschild. He's an author. He's an expert on conspiracy theories. He came out just last year with an excellent book, very informative book. It's called The Storm is Upon Us, How QAnon Became a Movement Cult and Conspiracy Theory of Everything. So welcome, Mike, to MindShift Podcast. Thank you for having me. So I've been fascinated by this book. I just finished reading it. Well, actually, I read it. It was read to me on Audible. I'll have to confess, but I have an hour's hour's long drive to work each way. So it's perfect to sit there and listen to a a good book. But I've done a lot of research on QAnon. I've done episodes on it before. But I'm thinking before we get into the QAnon thing, can we start sort of at the beginning? Okay, what exactly is a conspiracy theory in general? Why are people so drawn to them? Why are they so susceptible to conspiracy theories? Sure. So those are all huge questions that, mm. uh, you know, I could talk for an hour about sure. just uh, just on those. But my my own sort of personal definition of a conspiracy theory is any idea or notion of multiple people working together in secret to do something bad to someone else. Mm-hmm. So it's it's very important to uh, to understand the difference between actual conspiracies, which are very real, and conspiracy theories. And right. my understanding and my belief is that there has never been a popularly theorized conspiracy that later turned out to be true. Many of the most popular conspiracy theories are things that have just been in our culture for decades or centuries, whereas many of the real conspiracy theory, real conspiracies, things that are sort of retroactively thought of as conspiracy theories that came true, were never theorized. Mm. They, they weren't known about until we knew about them. And we knew about them through journalism, through a whistleblower, through congressional investigations, things like that. So these things weren't theorized until they were already out into the public. So the the real conspiracies, you know, the things like the tobacco companies uh, hiding right. the harmful effects of their products or various conspiracies to assassinate world leaders, you know, those are real things. But the theorized conspiracies, you know, the sort of dark cabal of string pullers mm-hmm. working together to shift world events, you know, those things are not really real. But it's certainly, yeah, it's not a new thing. I mean, you mentioned, for example, here's here's a conspiracy that spun out of an actual event. So the JFK was assassinated ostensibly by Lee Harvey Oswald, the single gun, the lone gunman theory and all sure. that. How many conspiracy theories have spun out of that actual event? The Russians killed him, the mafia killed him, the government killed him. It's It's been an enduring conspiracy theory that spent that came out of some sort of conspiracy surely oh sure sure and there are there are so many theorized shooters for Mm. who actually killed kennedy i I saw somebody it maybe is one of the books kind of deconstructing some of these theories that if all of these shooters were actually part of this there would have been something like 80 different assassins in (laughs) dealing plaza that day and it's like well if like they can't all have done it. So why do we think that any of them did it? Right. And, and so that you get, you know, decade after decade after decade of theories about what really happened, because we're looking for better explanations. You know, we look at somebody like John F. Kennedy as this American Titan, you know, this, this great man who had the, the world at his feet. And he was taken out by this loser, Lee Harvey mm. Oswald, you know, this, this schmo who never did anything of note in his life. And we don't we don't want it to be that way. We want a great man like Kennedy to have been the victim of a great conspiracy befitting his greatness. Mm. And and and, um, you know, unfortunately, it just wasn't like that. Mm. That's the problem. And I think you point out in the book the difference between, as you say, the conspiracy and a conspiracy theory. The problem is there's been just enough of them. To where we can prove, I mean, look at Project MK Ultra or some of these things. We know the government has done things, you know, then sure. when something like 9-11 happens, 
man, I mean, the conspiracy theory is just compounded from there. But there's enough where it is actually true, <laughs> where yeah. that's part of the problem, surely, isn't it? Well, sure. And it's not like uh, the government has our best interests in mind all mm. the time. It's not like banks and big businesses are, uh, you know, altruistic entities that exist only to help other people. That's not true at all. I mean, we, we know that, you know, these things often work against us or work for their own ends. And, and we know that powerful people get away with things all mm. the time that the rest of us could never hope to get away with. And so, you know, just because you are somebody who debunks or deconstructs conspiracy theories, people go, oh, you, you think that the, you know, the government is your friend and you're like mm. nothing bad ever happens. Well, no, it's just, a, it's a question of understanding what's really going on with these things and separating myth from reality. Because I think if you understand the reality, you're not as uh, susceptible to the myths. Mm. I was just reading an article on the BBC. It's really interesting talking about why do people believe in conspiracy theories? There's something about that. It makes them feel powerful in a world where there's like a lot of powerlessness. Certainly right. we saw that in the COVID pandemic, people were afraid they were scared. They wanted answers and they went online, started researching this. And so some of this relates to giving them some sense of empowerment as well. Doesn't it? Right. It, it makes you feel like somebody is in control and that even if they are uh, working against you, there's somebody at the top who knows what's going on, and you are not the victim of uh, random circumstance. You know, if you're walking down a street and an air conditioner falls out of a window and crushes you, you would rather believe that somebody pushed it out of the window to take you out because you knew too much mm. than you just happened to be the person who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and, oops, nothing you can do about it. There's something very comforting in thinking that powerful forces are working against us, even if we can't ever do anything about it. At least we know that it's happening. Yeah, so they, it's always that elusive right. they. they, them, yeah. They're yeah. pulling the strings. So how far back does it go? Because certainly QAnon isn't the first conspiracy theory around the block. I mean, this BBC article listed just a few, and I thought, oh, I, I forgot about some of those. You know, Elvis isn't dead and you know, JFK Jr. did faked his death and he's going to sure. come back. And I mean, you could list thousands of conspiracies. But how far back does it go? Because I can recall reading things where in medieval times, the Jews were blamed for some of the plagues, you know, and that was sure. a conspiracy in, in a way, you know, the Rothschild banking family and the Illuminati and things like that. I mean, how far back in history do these conspiracy theories actually stretch? It goes back to the very beginning. Mm -hmm. There were, um, during the great fire of Rome, there were Roman citizens who believed that the emperor set the fires on purpose in order to do away with his enemies or crack down on, on the people. You know, anytime something uh, big and outsized and unexpected happens, you're going to find a certain number of people who look at that and will not accept what they're being told about it, who think that there is something else going on. And in a lot of ways, that's just how evolution has wired our brains. Mm -hmm. You know, if we see a, a tree rustling, we are hardwired to think of it as dangerous because the one time we don't think it's dangerous, it's gonna be a panther and it leaps out and eats our face. The vast majority of the time, it's not a panther, but that one time is enough to end a genetic line. So our brains have wired themselves to see danger, to see hidden, patterns in what looks to be just chaos and noise. So conspiracy theories go back to the beginning of organized society because it's just our brains doing what they've developed to do. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere, I think it might have been uh, one of Kurt Anderson's books where he talks about conspiracy theories. They're like a bracketed playoff system. Anywhere you enter into the system, it just leads you into other conspiracy theories that seems to be a, a truism doesn't it? it's like you could start yeah. out looking at, at videos on youtube about the truth in air quotes about 9 11 or the pandemic and then you know it's it's like the next thing and the next thing and the next thing you're off into the to the world of conspiracy theories sure i, I like to think of conspiracy theories as pringles uh mm. nobody eats just one pringle <laughs> right. and uh nobody very few people believe in just one conspiracy theory because once you're into one outlandish, unevidenced thing, what is the point of not being into another one? If you go, well, you know, JFK was assassinated by a you know conspiracy of the Corsican mafia and the Secret Service and the Illuminati. 
but oh, but they couldn't fake the moon landings. They would never. Do that. Right. I mean, it's like, what, what's why bother? Why bother having any barriers to entry? And of course, we saw that firsthand during the pandemic. People yeah. were looking for answers as to what was going on, why this virus was spreading so much, why it seemed like the uh, medical advice on it was shifting week by week. You know, first they say, well, masks don't do anything. Then you mm-hmm. have to wear your mask everywhere. Oh, you need to sanitize all the doorknobs. All the, you don't need to sanitize the doorknobs. All of this is changing very rapidly. And rather than saying, this is just how things work with a fast moving unknown illness, We ascribe conspiracy. We go looking for answers. And if you're a person who already is inclined to think that something like 5G technology is harmful or, uh, you know, Bill Gates is a genocidal maniac who wants to kill all of us, you're going to go online and find a bunch of people who think that. And then a social media algorithm says, oh, we see that you liked the Bill Gates is a genocidal maniac group. What about the anti-vaccine group? You might like that, too. And you go, oh, I guess that's that's interesting. I'll take a look at that. And you radicalize yourself without even really intending to do it just because you're not satisfied with what you're being told. Yeah, they, it's always they, the shadowy yeah. they, they don't want yeah. you to know the truth. Well, you talk about earlier conspiracy theories. Okay, so it's QAnon. When I started researching it, as we know, it really exploded, I think, during the pandemic. It was kind of bubbling below the surface, you know, in places like 4chan and other places. But You talk about some stuff that was sort of laying the groundwork, and I didn't realize this stuff. You talk about some of the wealth and money scams going back into the probably the 70s and 80s. Then there was the Dinar scam. And of course, I'm familiar with the satanic panic in the 1980s because I was an evangelical growing up in the 80s in the States, and I was part and parcel of that. Then you talk about, you know, Pizzagate and some of that. How did these sort of lay the groundwork or feed into what would become QAnon? Yeah, there's a direct line, even if they don't acknowledge each other, there's a, there's a real direct line between the intensity and popularity of a lot of these scams. And, and what really drew my attention to QAnon was that it was very similar to these things like the Dinar scam, like Nasara, where there was an all-knowing uh, omniscient guru who was plugged into this secret knowledge that only a select few people were allowed to know about. And by knowing about it, you could profit off of it. But it also had these very lurid elements, the way something like Pizzagate did, or going back a little bit, the way the Satanic Panic did. You know, there was these very sort of graphic ideas of children being tortured and all these horrible Mm -hmm. sexual things going on. So that those two things on their own are very compelling. There's a reason why we love sort of almost pornographic details of the violence being done to other people. And we also love the idea that with very little effort, we can achieve all of our financial goals and get everything we want just by plugging into the advice of the right person. So when you combine all of those things together, it becomes a conspiracy theory that is so multifaceted and hits so many buttons in our psyche that it's really no wonder that it took off to the extent that it did. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that right away when I started researching QAnon, it was basically, I called it satanic panic 2.0 because it had so many of the same storylines, you know, this uh, cabal of pedophile satanic worship and murder of children. And I'm like, wait a minute, (laughs) I've heard this all before back in the eighties when I was, an evangelical, you know, it was all the satanic panic. It was kind of redressed and regurgitated for the for this new generation, I suppose. Yeah, you you do find that you find a, a recycling of these tropes. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, you find that with a lot of the anti-Semitic stuff. Um, it really tends to come in waves. There there will be a sort of a wave of public acceptance of anti-Semitism, and the accusations get weirder and and more lurid. And you find that a lot with modern conspiracy theories. They, they take the same ideas, they put them through the technology of the time and sort of the social culture of the time and, and sort of push them back out to people. So that's why you see things like QAnon getting very caught up in, in some of these very modern conservative woes like cancel culture. But it, it really, it's just the same stuff that they've been pushing out over and over again. The powerful group of string pullers, the lurid, horrible things they're doing to good Christian patriots. And these are the ways that you can identify them. And these are the things that you can do about it. The, the names and the details will change, but the underlying facets of it really never change. Hmm. 
Isn't it true that a lot of the a lot of it goes back to anti-Semitism? Isn't that kind of at the root of a lot of these things? The Rothschild, the banking, you know, the Jews are really controlling the world, the bankers of the world, and all the rest of it. A lot of it yeah. kind of seems to come back to that that sort of foundation. Yeah, and it, it's very much wrapped up in the financial string pulling ideas mm-hmm. that there is a, a a finite amount of money being hoarded by this very insular community. And they will do anything to keep people out of it. They will do anything to keep all of that money in their own community. So you get the, the classic trope of the, the greedy Jew and the cheap Jew and, and these things that just get recycled over and over and over again. And they, they take a lot of these same facets. I mean, the, the stuff about adrenochrome and QAnon is very similar to stuff um, from the blood libel of the 12th and 13th centuries. And that would be recycled over and over and over again. And and every generation would get its own sort of Jewish panic. You know, you'd get it in the mid 1800s with something like the Damascus affair, where there was a a Capuchin monk who disappeared and rumors of the local Jewish community in Damascus killing him and using his blood for matzah. And it's the same stuff that just gets used over and over because it works. And it's very identifiable and it's very easy to get behind if you're somebody who already doesn't trust Jewish people, who doesn't trust rich people. And then you get fed these lurid accusations and you go, well, there's no reason why this couldn't be true. And we just deal with it over and over again. It certainly worked for Hitler and the Nazis, didn't it? Blaming the Jews yeah. for them losing Germany, losing World War One. They were stabbed in the back and it was the Jews faults and everything else. So. Yeah, it's 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 a trope that works, as you say. Well, looking at QAnon, then okay, so we we know it's got a history, it's got a backstory. But when did it actually start the actual QAnon conspiracy theory? Because I was always thinking that it was that first Q drop in what is it, 2017 on 4chan. Right. But you talk about it seems to go back to a cryptic remark that Trump himself made when he was president, and off the back of that came the first Q drop. So what's the actual story, that backstory there? Yeah, so the first Q drop, or what we think of as a Q drop, started in October of 2017, and it was a couple of weeks after this very bizarre remark by President Trump, who said that uh, he was at a, a gathering of military officers and their spouses, and everyone is in their dress uniforms, and it's all very formal, and Trump is is saying to the press there, this could be the calm before the storm, this could be the calm before the storm. And he says it a couple of times, and nobody has any idea what he's talking about. The, the press is asking, you know, what storm, Mr. President? He says, you'll find out, you'll find out, and no one knows what he means. The next day, everybody in the White House is being asked about it. Nobody has a clue what it means. Trump just keeps saying it. You'll find out, you'll find out. It's one of those things that he says. It doesn't mean anything. It, 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 there's no weight behind it. It's just it's just a person sort of thinking whatever or saying whatever comes into their head. Mm-hmm. And this group of, of people on 4chan, very rabid Trump supporters who were used to these kinds of coded riddles and these fake characters who would show up and pretend to be a, you know, a, an FBI insider or a, an intelligence insider would answer questions and then they would disappear. And somebody showed up on 4chan pretending to be plugged into the White House and into military intelligence who knew that this was all the beginning of some great operation that would sweep away the deep state, that would put Hillary Clinton in chains and finally, you know, unleash the full potential of the MAGA universe. Mm -hmm. And people just ran with it. And I think people ran with it because it was it was actually very skillfully done at the beginning. You know, this this story of these mass arrests and here's all the things that will happen and you'll know what's going on. This was very well done. It it was done by somebody who's very familiar with 4chan, very familiar with kind of American conservative evangelical tropes and what these people really wanted. And it really offered what these folks had wanted for decades, which was Hillary Clinton to be brought to justice. So the first Q drop was, Hillary Clinton, uh, extradition in process, passport has been flagged. Uh, the, you know that, that her arrest has happened because there will be riots in the streets. The Marines and National Guard will, will be called up. It, it's in one post, it's telling this story that sounds like it's right out of a Tom Clancy book. And it was this very detailed, very interesting story. And people just went crazy over it. 
Yeah, so uh, or Da Vinci Code sort of thing, another Dan Brown yeah. type. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Well, what I was so surprised when I was went through when I went through your book was that you talked about before the first Q drop in 2017, there was actually a number of conspiracists. They they'd been posting things on 4chan, but but were actually very similar to what Q ended up dro- you know that first Q drop. But why did Q's drop become so massive? Is it what you're saying that that just the pure timing coming off the back of Trump's comment and then it just exploded? Why didn't the other uh, conspiracists, you know, get picked up in, in the way that Q's first drop did. Yeah, I, I really do think it has to do with the idea that it was about Hillary Clinton, you know, and, and a mm-hmm. lot of these other Anons were like, the answers they would give to questions would be very cryptic, they'd be very, like, they, they're not really saying anything, there's nothing really interesting here, there's no call to action, where with Q, there was a series of steps laid out in those first 100 or 150 drops of this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, and here are all of the ways that you will know it's happening. And one of the things that I think the author of the Q drops did was piggyback off of this conspiracy theory that was already going around that there was going to be an Antifa uprising. Uh, I think it was supposed to be November 4th, um, that, that Antifa would be going door to door, hunting for Trump supporters, and rioting in the streets, and and like sort of mass anarchy and that whoever was doing this believed that this uprising was going to happen and that Trump would declare an insurrection and he would send the National Guard in and it would all prove that this thing was actually happening Mm -hmm. and that it was like a conspiracy theory that was going to prove itself in a couple of days. Now, there was never an Antifa uprising. This was never going to happen. It was it was clear was an invention of of pranksters, basically. But by that point, people had already kind of gotten sucked into the story because there were heroes and villains. There were, you know, signs that all of these things were going to happen. And Trump was going to go on Twitter and announce that this was happening. And within about a week, you started to see the creation of a of a content creation sphere around this, you know, decoding these posts of making videos about it, of sharing it. And very quickly it took off because people just really wanted it to be true and when you really want something to be true you will believe anything about it that's true yeah they just exploded well you say in the book i appreciate the fact that you you sort of look at the whole sort of canon i guess you could say of the q drops because it's been nearly five thousand drops isn't it some yeah. uh you know thousands and thousands of drops and you actually paint a picture you say he's Q or whoever Q is, if it's a if it's a single person or a group of people or what we don't know exactly, but it's like he, let's say he for the minute, is is telling us a story. There's a storyline, there's a narrative into which Donald Trump fits as a central character. What is that story that Q is actually telling to, I guess, his followers? Sure. And and that's a really interesting way to do to differentiate it there was there really was a story with these drops this was not just a bunch of random stuff there was a beginning middle and an end now what happened when it got to the end and nothing happened is that q said oh that you know i wasn't talking about hillary i was talking about saudi arabia Mm -hmm. and when i said hillary clinton i meant uh mohammed bin salman and i mean it's like crazy stuff like how can you expect people to be that stupid but of course, people are that stupid and hmm. wanted to believe it. They wanted it to be true. So the story that Q is telling is that there is a team of military intelligence officers working side by side with Trump. I mean, like literally working in the Oval Office, like across the desks from each other. Mm-hmm. And they're leaking out clues to this great purge of the deep state that's going to happen. And at some point, Donald Trump would have gone on Twitter and said, my fellow Americans, the storm is upon us. And then uh, hundreds of thousands of indictments would be unsealed and uh, tactical teams would go door to door, making mass arrests of prominent Democrats, prominent people in finance, prominent people in Hollywood, Mm -hmm. who are all part of this uh, elite pedophile ring that is running the world. And all of these people will be taken to Guantanamo Bay. They'll all be executed. And then we will live in peace and harmony. And I think one of the things that makes Q so appealing, especially to older fans of it, is it's not about nihilism. It's not we're going to watch the world burn and, and every and you know, we're going to destroy the planet and it's all going to be just a big laugh. 
it's that everything's going to be great when all this is over. We're going to get all of the secret technology that's been suppressed. We're going to get the secret cures that have been suppressed. We're going to get the truth about aliens and JFK and free energy and, and you know, the JFK hiding and, and all of these things that the deep state and their media arm are keeping from us. So when all of the bad people are, are gotten rid of, then we're going to have uh, free energy and cures for cancer and everything's going to be amazing. So it, it has a utopian element to it. And one of mm. the interesting things that I've been realizing in working on my next book is that there is a strain of utopianism that is very anti-Semitic. Uh, a lot of the early utopian thinkers were very, very anti-Jewish, very socialist. They wanted a complete redistribution of wealth. And so you, you tie into all of these ideas of the people who are at the bottom are going to come up to the top and the people at the top are going to be brought down to the bottom and everybody's going to be equal. And anybody who has more than you do is going to be gotten rid of. And it, it gives you a world that is worth fighting for, that is worth aspiring to. It's not just going to be anarchy and riots in the streets. It's going to be, everything's going to be great. We just have to execute a quarter of a million people to get there. Oh, this small detail there. Sure, <laughs> sure. Sure. When we come back from the break in the second half of this chat with Mike Rothschild, we're going to get into this issue of why in particular does QAnon appeal to so many American evangelicals? What is that about? We see now more than a year, way past a year, beyond the January 6th insurrection, Trump is, is gone from office. He's no longer president. That has not stopped him from spreading the big lie. And as we know, if you've kept up with any of this stuff, you'll see that in general, it's just become common parlance among so many American evangelicals. They'll just spout things like the deep state and, you know, Trump's big lie. They'll just spout all that. And it's all somehow wrapped up in these conspiracy theories of which QAnon played a huge part and still does. And we're going to look at this issue of the many failed Q prophecies. Surely that would bring out as a level of cognitive dissonance in the Q adherents and they would leave the movement, surely. And then when we conclude, we're going to get into this issue of how can you help someone get out of the movement? As I talked with Jen Senko just a few weeks ago of the brainwashing of my dad, she talked about that at the end of her book. As you know, if you've read the book or seen the documentary, it is possible to get someone out of a radicalized movement such as QAnon, the Fox News universe, that whole right-wing media machine, the outrage machine. It is possible. And I'm going to ask Mike how you can do that. It is possible. So we're going to look at that at the end of this conversation. But what I wanted to do before we get back into the second half is I wanted to tell you what's coming up here in the next few episodes on the show. I've had a conversation, actually a couple of them. I talked to Mike Phillips. You may know him from Twitter at Sack Writer. He's a therapist out of Southern California. And as I mentioned last time in the last episode, he has a very similar story to mine in that we were both evangelical pastors he went a different route. He became a therapist, but he deals a lot with religious trauma syndrome and that kind of thing. So I have a lot of questions for Mike. That was a really good conversation. And then I caught up with another good friend of mine, Dean Crosetz. He used to do the People I Meet podcast. He's not doing that anymore, but we had a good catch up. And I wanted to find out where he's at nowadays, how he's reconstructing his life, rebuilding it after leaving really charismatic Christianity. We talked a lot about his time when he was in Houston, Texas, getting involved with some kind of dominionist groups some prayer spiritual warrior stuff down there and how he kind of journeyed out of that and he's rebuilding his life. So that's a really good conversation. Good to catch up with people that I haven't talked to in a, in a year or two. So catching up with Dean. And then as I'm doing this recording now, in just a few minutes, I'm jumping on a Zoom call with Luna Corbden. I met her through the conference on religious trauma not long ago through a good friend, a mutual friend, Janice Selby who put the conference on, and she was one of the presenters there. Now, Luna is an ex-Mormon, and she's got a lot of fantastic resources for those of you coming out of Mormonism, and she's done a lot of study and a lot of research. So I'm going to have a lot of questions for Luna, so I'm really looking forward to that conversation. And then in September, we're going to be picking up our MindShift Zoom calls once again. We do these once a month, and I think I might have Carrie Noble coming back uh, to talk to us. That's another conversation that I've had, too. Carrie is another fascinating one. I met him through Casey of the Cult Vault podcast. 
and he told this incredible story about how back in the 70s and 80s he got involved in what basically became a cult, like a racist, white supremacist, militia type of cult, sort of the forerunners to your Proud Boys, your Oath Keepers, those kind of Patriot Front type groups now, but it was called the Covenant Sword and Arm of the Lord, or the CSA, based out of Arkansas, and he got into some unbelievable stuff, some incredible adventures and experiences that I'm just going to let him tell you the story. So we've got Mike Phillips, we've got Dean Crosets, and we've got Kerry Noble coming up, as well as Luna Corbden. So we've got some fantastic stuff heading your way. I was just going to mention, too, that when this episode drops, it still won't be too late for you to book into the Conference on Death, Grief, and Belief, which is going to be held in Portland, Oregon, the weekend of the 16th and 17th of July. It's coming up just real soon here as I'm doing this recording now. I'm going to be doing a presentation there. We're going to have Seth Andrews, my good friend Janice Selby is going to be there, some other people that I've done some other things with. So you can still get on the conference on death, grief, and belief. It's not too late to book your tickets. You can do it virtually. You can attend the conference online. And I'll put a link to the conference in the show notes. So that's really cool. And the other thing, speaking of really cool stuff, in September we're going to be starting up our Mind Shift podcast Zoom calls again. And in fact, I'm going to see if I can get Luna Corbden, the one I'm going to be talking to in a little bit here, to come on that call, either her or Carrie. We're going to do those again starting in September. And the way you can get access to those calls is to become a supporter of the show on Patreon, which as always is in the show notes. You can click that link Go to my Patreon page, see how you can support the show. And that is a really cool benefit that you get to become part of the Mindship Podcast community. All right, let's get back on into this chat with Mike Rothschild as we look at this issue of The Storm is Upon Us Inside the QAnon Conspiracy Theory Cult. Well, how about this issue of apocalypticism, too? Because you mentioned, okay, there's a utopian strain, but we've seen it's exploded in American evangelical churches, and pastors are wringing their hands because their parishioners are spouting QAnon conspiracy theories and not listening to them anymore, if they if they ever did. But right. is that part of, you think, why it exploded so much in evangelicalism? Because it sounds like, coming from an ex-evangelical point of view, to me, you're talking, that's the book of Revelation, the book of sure. Daniel, this apocalyptic literature where evil is going to be swept away, there's going to be a cataclysmic final battle, and Jesus and God are going to reign supreme over the earth, and it'll be this wonderful time of you know, millennial kingdom and all the rest of it. That sounds like what you just articulated with the Q story. Yeah, it's very much like that. It is very much like we're going to go through this period of tribulation, but then it's going to be great. It's going to be a thousand years of peace and whatever. And, and I think why it appeals to the evangelical community so much is I think a, a lot of the reason why Trump appeals to the evangelical community is here is somebody who's going to do something. This isn't just talk. This isn't uh, love your neighbor, turn the other cheek, let them take away everything from you, let them inflict their godless progressivism on you. It's here is going to be somebody who takes it back to the way it used to be and the way it should be. And, and that's where I think a lot of the fear of cancel culture comes from. This idea that if you say the wrong thing, they're going to come after you. You, you can't tell the jokes that you used to tell. You can't uh, eat as much meat as you used to. You know, now, oh, men can be women and women can be men. And when is it ever going to end? When are, when are the changes ever going to stop? Mm -hmm. Something like QAnon promises a return to the family, a return to the way it used to be when learned men ruled over everything. Mm -hmm. And people who were trying to take that away from you would be punished. There, there, you know, there's a reason why something like Make America Great Again took off so much with these people. And I think Q is very similar to that. We're going to make the world great again. We're going to put it under godly men who will tell you what to do and they will have your best interests in mind. And all the people who are trying to change things, they're going to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have and we're going to have peace after that. So there, there is a very primal fear of change. Uh, a fear of progress and Q and Trump and the evangelical movement are all wrapped up into that together. 
So might, there might be a dominionist strain to, into the yes. whole storyline as well. Well, the other thing I picked up on when I was researching it, a lot of it kind of blew up in everyone's face on the January 6th insurrection. I mean, there you saw for the first time, perhaps all on display, you had Christian nationalism, you had militia groups like the Proud Boys and the one percenter or three percenters, and you had prominently QAnon everywhere. It all kind of came together. But one thing that struck me was that you got these Q influencers, guys like the Praying Medic and so many others. Yeah. If it wasn't for them, I don't think it would have gone nearly as far as it has. But they're like sort of like the priests and, and pa pastors of this religion or cult, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on if, if, this is, if it indeed is a cult. But it seems like they're, you know, Q has his drops and it's like scripture. It's like sacred science, as Lifton would call it. And then they sort of parse it. They explain it and, you know, break it down just like a pastor would break down the Bible in a sermon. And the people go, oh, right. I get it. I understand it. Now I know what I need to go do. So it seems like there's this almost a hierarchy of this priestly class of Q influencers that then pass it along. Because a lot of people wouldn't have gone on 4chan or 8chan, were they, or 8kun. They found out about it through memes or through uh, these people on YouTube, didn't they, or social media. Yes. And there was a very early effort to, tr to draw more people into this, but at the same time, keep them away from places like 4chan. Because 4chan, I mean, certainly the content is, you know, horrifying and yeah. objectionable but it's also really really hard to use like it's it's hard to to navigate it if you if you don't really know how it works so there was a a desire to have people get involved in this and to decode the drops and just pass them on to people but to avoid the really lurid stuff so that's where you had these aggregator sites mm -hmm. and that's where you had the the this almost like you're saying a priestly class who interpret the scriptures and tell you what it really means and give you more, more things to think about and more things to look at. So it very much sets itself up like a religion where there's the gospel at the, at the very top, mm -hmm. but the, the interpreters of the gospel are the next layer under them. They're telling you all of these other things and giving you all these other books to read. Oh, if you want to know more about the, you know, domination of the media, oh, read the protocols of the elders of Zion. It'll right. change your life. I mean, just, just stuff like that, where it is turning into its own church. And I can totally understand why if you are a pastor at an actual church, you're going, they're replicating what we offer, but turned inside out. It's about hate. It's about fear. It's about eliminating enemies. And it's about forming a community of people who are all terrified of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Or you have pastors like Greg Locke. You know, right. people like him, he's jumping on the Q bandwagon, you know, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world. She's an evangelical, you know, she's ranting. Apparently she's got her own Facebook channel now yeah. talking about how Bill Gates is growing, you know, synthetic hamburgers and his, sure. peach, his peach tree yeah. dishes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not, not peach tree dishes. Right, right. <laughs> but one of the things that struck me too, this, this issue of, okay, is Q a cult or a religion? You've also got a number of, I guess you could say prophecies or predictions. So the whole thing was based on, like you say, the very first drop. Q saying Hillary is going to be arrested. She's going to be fleeing for the border. And you know, all these people are going to be sent to Guantanamo and all that. But basically none of them have come to pass, but that's a yeah. hallmark of religion. But why, why haven't the Q adherents abandoned the religion? Cause you talk about Festinger's book, when prophecy right. fails, right. this relates to cognitive dissonance on some level. Why haven't they said, okay, come on, look at the body of predictions. None of them have come true. Uh, let's get out of this thing. Uh, how does that relate to this cognitive dissonance issue? Yeah, it, it's uh, and and when prophecy fails, really is a touchstone for this mm -hmm. book. And it's really some a book that everybody should read uh, because it yes. really it really goes into how could people sit around and be let down time after time after time and think, well, this time it's really going to happen. It wasn't the right time the last time, like. The, well, the, you know, the, the viewer told us that the UFO was going to show up on Wednesday at three o'clock. Well, you know, it was too cloudy on Wednesday at three right. or, you know, we didn't, have, us. <laughs> we didn't have the right vibes. It was our fault. You, yeah. you get so uh, tied into this event happening that it starts to become inconceivable that it won't happen. Mm -hmm. You've given up too much. You've gone too far. You can't go back. If you've, if you've been a part of a movement like a UFO cult or QAnon, if you've been in that for months or years and you've given up 
your familial relationships, your friendships, your job, if this has become your existence, you are not going to listen to anybody telling you this was all for naught. This was a joke. You've been had. So everything that happens is all just grist for the mill of this thing eventually happening. Well, it didn't happen this time, but that just means it's going to happen even bigger next week. And if you yeah. keep tempting people with it's going to happen soon, it's going to happen soon, it's going to happen next week. Oh, it's not the right time. Sorry, uh, D- deep state got in the way. It's not can't happen this week, but it's definitely going to happen next week. It's always you know, something. That's, yeah, oh, it's always something, and that's how yeah. these sort of prophecy scams work. Uh, where true. something like the dinar, where it's like, well, we're getting word from the mosques that it's going to happen next Tuesday or Wednesday, and then Wednesday comes around. Oh, you know, the IMF put a new rule in place or, oh, that the time wasn't right. Or, you know, the, the, uh, the money wasn't in the, the correct place, you know, just have to wait a couple more days. And it's like, at that point, it's like, I've waited years for this. What's another day or two. Right. And, and then, and then at some point you have wasted your life and, yeah. and, and nobody wants to think, Oh, I wasted my life. I I've got conned. They took everything away from me. Uh, I guess I'll just have to go back to my family and say, yeah, you were right. No, no one's going to do that. It's true. And so surely on some level, it must relate to the sunk cost fallacy as well. Isn't sure. it? You just keep plowing. It's going to work. It's going to work. I'm just going to keep yeah. putting more money into this thing, you know, and eventually, well, I mean, look at that. Like you say, so many religions, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they predicted the end of the world, Armageddon dating back to the 19th century. And every time it didn't happen, they always had an explanation right. for, you know, right. something did happen, but it was an invisible movement. You know, you just didn't see it. And, you it know, was so the, there's always it, something. Right. It wasn't the end times. It was the beginning of the end times. That's right. Or, you know, I I got my math slightly wrong because I didn't yeah. take into account the feast of whatever. Forgot there's to carry no, the one. <laughs> forgot to carry the one. You know, I, I counted Tuesday as the beginning and it started Monday midnight. I mean, there's always an excuse and there's always a reason why this wasn't the right time, but the next time it will definitely be the right time. And, definitely. and you, can keep, you can keep people on a string like that almost indefinitely. Right. And some will leave, though. That That's the legacy, too, I think, of the book as well. Because when I read the book, I, 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 get, I guess I came away thinking everybody that was in that UFO cult just doubled down and, you know, dug in even harder. But yeah. I was reminded not long ago talking to an ex-Jehovah's Witness, and he said, actually, the truth is that a number did leave. And the same yeah. with the Jehovah's Witness. Actually, a, a, a bunch of people left in 1975, um, and but they've been gaining them back, you know, people back in. Right. So it's like, it builds and builds and you will lose some. Um, now, w- one of the questions I have, you know, about social media, we talk about, you talk about in the book that a lot of platforms were really slow to get on this thing. What we need to ban this Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and stuff, but they finally have, but you talk about the importance of memes. That's kind of a way to get around a lot of these gates, isn't it? How important is it for Q adherents to share memes and kind of use that to spread the word? It's hugely important. Uh, memes are a visual language and they allow you to communicate uh, a very small and very impactful amount of information in a very eye-catching way. Um, you know, Q talks about how important memes are, how a meme can very quickly be sent to somebody, very quickly be posted on Facebook or Twitter, and it, it gets your attention and it's a very small piece of information and you don't bother fact checking it because you're like, oh, that sounds like something that could be true or hmm, that I don't like that, that I don't like the way that sounds. And you go looking for more things about that. Mm-hmm. And so what it does is it boils down a very complicated conspiracy. And these conspiracy theories are extraordinarily complicated. And it boils it down into a very short and easily uh, shareable piece of information. So something like memes are perfect for a conspiracy theory like QAnon. Well, now there's a, a number of them, though. It goes beyond just sharing memes and sharing videos and things. You think about uh, Jen Senko, her book, The Brainwashing of My Dad, you right. know, and he he gets into this thing and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. But for him, it's, as far as it went, was ranting about it at the dinner table and sending emails to his f- friends and families and, you know, all that. But there's been a number of actual people who have been so radicalized, they've actually gone out and committed crimes uh, in the name of Q or QAnon, um, aside from the January 6th instruction, what do you think explains that that there's a segment where they go, I've got to actually do something. I've got to shoot this place up like the guy who 
tried to shoot up the Comet Ping Pong, you know, pizza parlor right. where was, <laughs> supposedly these cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles were in the basement. You know, it goes beyond just being radicalized and sharing memes and things. Right. And I, I think it's important to understand that most people who are into this world will not commit a crime. I mean, there, sure. there is a very small number of people who will be so deep into this and, and get such a messianic complex that they're inclined to go shoot somebody. That's, that's fairly rare. But of course, when it happens, it, it's, it's a really jarring event because you think to yourself, who could get pulled into a conspiracy theory so deeply that it, it turns you into a criminal? Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it makes you feel like you are in danger. The, the people who commit crimes who are Q believers or, or crimes based on QAnon, they're people who believe that they are being hunted, that there is somebody after them and somebody trying to hurt them, trying to hurt their family, trying to hurt America. So a lot of the, these killings are carried out by people who think that they're striking back. Um, you know, certainly going to the, uh, the murder of the Gambino family boss. You know, this, this guy who did this truly believed that this was a person who was part of the deep state and who was a danger to them and that they were fighting back. Uh, you know, these horrible stories of people who've like killed their kids, killed their families, mm-hmm. you know, killed their, kill, you know, guy who killed his brother, who believed that they were uh, contaminated with reptilian DNA, that they were, that they were uh, saving the world by doing this. And of course, there's a point here where you become, you know, you're not competent to stand trial. And in several yeah. of these cases, these people have been found mentally incompetent. But the, the something like QAnon is perfect for a worldview like that because it hits all those buttons of danger, of saving the world, of fighting back, silencing these voices that are against you. It's very dangerous because these people have no check on them and, of course, are easily able to get firearms. Mm, that's a problem. Well, yeah. as we're doing this recording now, just a few weeks ago, we had the kid in uh, Buffalo doing yeah. that shooting. And I, I was thinking about you when I was reading about his manifesto. There was an article that came out just not too long ago where they, some professors at Leiden University, they actually went through and uh, analyzed his manifesto. And they said, OK, what is the core sort of you know storyline here? And a lot of it is anti-Semitic and he buys into the great replacement conspiracy theory. But I was thinking of you because a lot of his stuff related to when he got on 4chan about, well, during the pandemic, he was probably about 16 or so. And he said something to the effect that, you know, I didn't know the truth until I didn't know the reality until 4chan, you know, gave me the truth. And then he was away and he was, you know, buying into all these conspiracy theories to the point where he's got to get some weapons, drive for what, two hours or more and shoot a bunch of African-American people because they're replacing white people. Right. (laughs) I mean, right. that's going and, beyond, way far beyond, isn't it? Right. And and there's always going to be a segment of the population who is just angry and looking for somebody to blame for their misfortunes mm-hmm. and for for them just having a crappy life. And, you know, a lot of these, these shooters are just losers. You know, they're finding other communities of losers who, who all sort of get together in their loserdom. And somebody goes, I'm going to fight back. I, I'm going to, I'm going to win the battle. And it's never about a, accomplishing a final goal. I mean, these, these, these guys never put any real thought into like changing the world through activism, through, you know, running for office or I mean, mm-hmm. whatever it is. It's, it's always just, I'm going to lash out violently. And it doesn't matter whether I live or die. I have no plans for the future after this. I'm not, I'm not going to get away with it. Um, the, you know, the manifestos are published knowing that they'll be passed around because they don't have any intention of, of you know, escaping. They're either going to get killed or kill themselves or be arrested. You know, yeah. and it's, it, it's just a nihilism. It really is. And, and one thing, too, I thought about you again, because apparently in it, I didn't read his manifesto, but apparently in the manifesto, he had a lot of memes in it. And I thought, there you go. There's there's a connection, maybe not to QAnon specifically, but in the sense that he had loads and loads of memes. And a lot of his stuff was cobbled from the Christchurch, uh, Christchurch right. New Zealand shooter. You know, so the, and these were, again, posted on places like 4chan, which are just hotbeds of conspiracies and, you know, racism and um, anti-women, anti-LGBTQ, right. shocking, shocking content in there. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, radicalization for sure, isn't there? 
Yeah, and, and it's um, feeding into these ideas that people find in the worst places. And these are very durable ideas. You know, mm-hmm. the idea of uh, striking back against the wealthy, against the string pullers, you know, the people who are, who are you know, replacing good Christian Americans with, you know, filthy immigrants. I mean, this is just, this is all classic stuff. It's repackaged mm-hmm. in a very compelling way, but there's a reason why these things keep happening. That's and true. it's because the tropes that they present are incredibly durable and incredibly tested by time. And they work on a certain type of person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it appeals to the rage, the anger, like you say, the fact that my life is shit. And I need to, yeah. I'm going to lash out at the people who did this to me or they're doing it to me. Well, last couple of questions, we did kind yeah. of allude to this. Do you think that QAnon is a cult? Does it fit that definition? Because in the book, you talk about this cult leader, cult experts and sociologists, they're, they're divided. Some say, yes, it absolutely is a cult. Some say, well, it doesn't fit. Why do you think that's the case? What accounts for this sort of nebulous understanding of Q as a cult? Sure. I think it's hard because Q doesn't fit the, the sort of stereotype of a cult. It's not, uh, you know, a small group of people who are in the same place being led around by the nose by a leader. It's, it's mm-hmm. not like that. And of course, uh, you know, a lot of Q people are like, well, Q is the only cult that teaches you to think for yourself. Well, right. if you're in a group that is teaching you to think for yourself, that's probably a sign that you're in a cult. <laughs> yeah. So there, there is certainly thought control. There is certainly um, an in-group versus an out-group. There is the, you know, the, the, the world outside is scary and violent and evil. The world in here is safe and we're all together and, you know, we're all going to help each other. So that's very, that's very sort of classic cult stuff. But at the same time, it, it doesn't have that kind of leader at the top who's influencing everything, whose word is iron and who you, you know, you will be punished mm-hmm. if you defy that. Um, so it, it, it is and it isn't in a lot of ways. And I, and I understand why at the time I was doing these interviews a couple of years ago, a lot of people who are, who are very proficient in cults were like, it feels like a cult, but it also feels like it's not a cult. And I think now it's so mainstream that I think calling it a cult, I think is, is almost a little bit of a service. Mm-hmm. I think the QAnon that it really existed up until Biden's inauguration is very much a cult, but I think now it's almost just like a mainstream way of viewing the world. And it's much too diffuse and it's much too big to be considered a cult in the, in the, um, the form it's taken now. Right. It's not a monolith for sure, is it? Right. But maybe this is what Amanda Montel was talking about her book, Cultish. Sure. Maybe it's cultish. You know, there's a lot of things about it that are cultish, but it doesn't, like you say, fit the classic criteria. It's not a Jim Jones sort of thing, but man, right. you can sure draw a lot of parallels between the world of the cults and QAnon, I think for sure. Yeah. Well, last yeah. question, you talk about helping people to get out because again, if it, if it is cultish, let's say, uh, there are ways to get people out to help them rebuild their lives after leaving this group or cult or cultish movement or whatever. Can you comment on some of those strategies? How come some of them seem to work and how come some of these other ones don't work? I mean, to confront the queue adherent and ang- angrily argue with them, that probably won't bear a lot of fruit, will it? No, uh, there are there are sort of the ways that we look at on online of like, Oh, if you just shame them and mock them and, mm. and you know point out how stupid they are, the thing is that's going to just drive people deeper into it because nobody wants to think they're stupid. Nobody wants to think that they're, uh, you know, the victim of a of a scam. Like you're just going to go, no, I'm I'm not the loser. You're the loser. Yeah. you're the crazy one. You're the one but who's in on it. <laughs> right, you're the one. You're the one who who needs help. I don't need help. Right, if I'm you, fine. <laughs> right, I'm fine. I know the truth. But if you if you understand sort of why this is so compelling to a certain type of person, and if you have that person in your life, you know, you are absolutely within your rights to to cut off contact for one. But Mm -hmm. it but if you want to maintain contact to say to do it on your terms, to say, I'm not going to talk about Q or Trump or, or the election or COVID or whatever, I will talk to you about things that are going on in our lives or things that we used to enjoy together, sports or movies or whatever. But of course, these people isolate them, themselves from all that because those things that we all enjoy are links to the normal world, the world of, of the sheeple. 
And you, mm-hmm. you discard those things because those things are a distraction from research and from getting out the truth. So if you want to maintain contact with this person, you can you can keep it you know on those topics, but understand that if they really want to believe this is true, you can't get them out because they don't want to get out. There is no reason for them to get out. Uh, they think you're the crazy one for not being part of it. Mm-hmm. So if a person does start to waver, if something does um, no longer make sense to them, if there's one aspect of it that they go, hmm, that doesn't really add up for me anymore then you can start to talk to them about let's you know let's talk about this let's talk about how this works for you you can unplug them if you can get them away from the constant churn of of nonsense on social media that's a really really helpful thing even just breaking that cycle for a couple of days can really start to to kind of snap a person out of this and then just keeping in touch sort of asking them how they're doing, what they need. You don't want to talk about the conspiracy, but you let them know that you love them, that you care about them, and that if they start to reemerge from this world, you will be here for them. Because chances are most people are not going to be. Most people are just going to say, I don't want anything to do with this. This is all crazy. You know, stay, stay the hell away from me. Mm. And just by not saying stay the hell away from me, you are offering yourself as a safe haven if they do start to get out of it. Right. And it seems like a lot of these are sort of classic tips and tactics for helping people get out of an actual cult. You know, it's the same kind of thing when you were going through it in the book. I thought, you know, I I recognize these because I've done a lot of research on cults, you know. And the other thing, as you mentioned, uh, unplugging them from that sort of echo chamber, because, of course, going back to Jen Senko, what what sort of did it for her dad was his radio broke <laughs> so and he yeah. never got around to fixing it you know so suddenly he was cut off from rush limbaugh and all this right. stuff and then he went in the hospital and they got a new tv and he couldn't figure out how to you know program <laughs> yeah. the remote and yeah. his wife just said i'm gonna i'm gonna delete fox news and you know and he sort of like was unplugged from this echo chamber yeah. and slowly he regained his former identity and became his old self again after yeah. years of being this ranting, angry, conservative, yeah. you know, so it is possible for someone to get out of it, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, it takes uh, unplugging and it takes loved ones who stick with you and, and realize that the person that you used to be is still there. It's just buried under all these layers of garbage. Mm. It's so true. Well, the last question then is how can people find you? How can they get a hold of you? Because of course your book is called The Storm is Upon Us, How QAnon Became a Movement, Cult, and Conspiracy Theory of Everything, which I would highly recommend reading. But if they wanted to find you, where can they find you on social media? Sure. I post uh, probably too much on Twitter Mm. at RothschildMD. Um, You can find The the Storm is Upon Us. It's in uh, hardcover. The paperback will be coming out in August. There's a Kindle, there's an audiobook, um, and I, I do lots of things on Twitter, and, and you can find me there. And I'm, you know, anytime anybody has a question or, or a tip for me or just says, hey, I've been struggling with this, uh, you know, help me, I try to do what I can for people. And because yeah. um, there, there's, there's a lot of pain out there right now, and a lot of people who, who are sucked into a lot of different things. And I, I think everybody by now, know somebody who is pulled into some kind of harmful movement you know doesn't have to be QAnon it could be anything related to mm. the election or the pandemic or whatever there's there's a lot of people who who need uh, who need help right now yeah and I really appreciate the fact that you responded back on Twitter that's how this whole interview yep. came about so yep. much appreciated Mike I yep. thoroughly enjoyed talking to you yeah thank you so much for your work and I will hopefully speak to you again yep that would be good